The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has detected high levels of radioactive substances in a drainage channel. Tokyo Electric Power Company is investigating the cause. TEPCO officials say the alarm system went off around 10 a.m. on Sunday. The equipment showed a rise in radioactivity in the channel that leads to a nearby port. The levels of beta ray emitting substances were as high as 7,230 becquerels per litre. The figure is 10 times higher than temporary increases caused by rain. Officials suspect contaminated water in the channel may have leaked into the port. They've stopped transferring the contaminated water and have closed a gate of the drainage channel by the port. The channel used to be connected to a section of the coast beyond the port. TEPCO rerouted it after a series of leaks in 2013. The officials say the water level in a tank that contains contaminated water remains unchanged, showing no signs of leakage, and drain valves that keep water from leaking near the tanks remain closed. They're investigating the cause of the rising levels of radioactivity in the channel. Representatives of Japanese political parties are debating the Prime Minister's policy speech. Shinzo Abe last week reiterated his determination to push through the most sweeping reforms since World War II. The leader of the largest opposition DPJ party, Katsuya Okada, criticized the July cabinet decision on a new security policy. The government is preparing legislation to allow the country to exercise its right to collective self-defense. The cabinet made the decision without significant support from the public or discussions in the Diet. The ministers changed the interpretation of the Constitution on a crucial matter on their own judgment. It was a grave mistake in the history of constitutional democracy. The cabinet decided on the basic policy for security legislation. It does not change basic principles in the interpretation of the Constitution. We will continue our efforts to gain public approval of our new policy and proceed with legislations that would allow this country to cope with any kind of emergency situation. The Secretary General of Abe's Liberal Democratic Party called for more explanation to the public on regulatory reforms. Regulatory reforms in the areas of health care, employment, agriculture and energy are the most pressing challenges. However, some people do not seem to fully understand what those reforms are for. Drastic regulatory reforms would encourage dynamic entrepreneurship in the private sector and lead to various new business models. That's a key factor in my economic growth strategy. The leader of the Japan Innovation Party, Kenji Eda, questioned the government's energy policy. Prime Minister Abe says the government will reduce dependence on nuclear power as much as possible. But he says nuclear plants are an important baseload power source. Isn't that contradictory? Nuclear power requires low running costs and it's relatively reliable. It doesn't emit any greenhouse gases. So we consider it an important baseload power source on the condition we can secure the safety of its operations. The Prime Minister said the government will examine and approve emergency response plans, including evacuation of residents for possible accidents at nuclear power plants. All commercial reactors in the country are offline. Nuclear regulators are screening safety measures for 21 reactors that utilities want to operate.
The countdown has begun to the 2020 Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games. It is half a century since the last Tokyo Games in 1964, showcasing the nation's rapid post-war growth. So what is the message that Japan, now a developed country, wants to send to the world in 2020? I spoke with Toshiro Muto, Chief Executive Officer of the Tokyo Organizing Committee. Muto wants to create a successful sports festival, but he's also conscious of the legacy that the games will bequeath to the next generation. How do you plan to make the 2020 games different from 1964? The 1964 Olympics were hugely important in showcasing Japan's re-emergence on the international stage. The vital legacy has been the physical infrastructure built then, such as the Shinkansen bullet train and highways. For 2020, I'd like to put more weight on the softer legacies of the games. Muto says one example of this legacy is urban development, considerate to the needs of the elderly and disabled. The Paralympics will draw delegations and groups from across the globe. Tokyo will be the first city to host the Paralympics twice. We're placing a lot of emphasis on this. So the city must be barrier free, or in other words, universally designed. For example, a review is already ongoing in many parts of the city. That includes the route from the Tokyo International Airport to the Olympic Village to see if it is possible to do this in a wheelchair. Urban development based on universal design will definitely be a big theme. Islamic extremist groups have launched a string of terrorist attacks in various countries. With Japan also now on the target list, Muto says intensifying security is vital. We promoted Tokyo as a safe city, and in fact it still is considered the safest city in the world by many standards. But when thinking about the future, we might not be able to proclaim that so optimistically anymore. Terrorist attacks may actually happen in Japan, so we must put our best efforts into security. That includes cybersecurity. The London Games reportedly experienced more than 200 million cyber attacks. Tokyo might experience the same or worse. We have to develop the world's most advanced cybersecurity technology to cope. Government, business, and we ourselves must take special efforts to reach that level. The economic legacy of this technology will become important as well. Muto thinks recovery from the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011 should be another Olympic legacy. Many people want to connect the coming Olympics with the recovery from the disaster of 2011. How would you like to link these two together? I believe that recovery from the Great East Japan earthquake is an important perspective. There are still people abroad who vividly remember footage of the tsunami and have doubts about holding the Olympics in a country that has been so affected by disaster. So it's extremely important to show the world how Japan has rebuilt. People have asked us if special consideration can be given to the disaster-stricken areas during the Olympic torch relay. We've had requests to invite athletes from abroad to the three worst-hit prefectures and use these areas for training camps or for practice or to adjust to Japan's climate and time difference. If the people in the disaster hit areas are encouraged by seeing athletes and if this can be another step towards recovery, it would be an important effect for the Olympics. The Games will attract many foreign visitors. Muto wants them to enjoy the games and return home with some of Japan's charm in their hearts. 
Japanese culture contains both traditional and contemporary aspects, such as anime created by the young. Hospitality is also another part of this culture. If these are communicated to the world, it could lead to a re-evaluation of Japan. That will attract repeat foreign visitors who want to experience Japanese culture again. If signs and digital directions for foreign visitors were installed in every part of Japan so they wouldn't get lost, more people will be able to visit. They would go back home and tell their families and friends what a wonderful place Japan is. They'd talk about it for the rest of their lives. These are the kind of people who will serve as the best goodwill ambassadors. I don't want the 2020 Olympics to end as just a festival. What if the games shaped minds and left an impression on the young? People will look back on 2020 and remember what a wonderful year it was. That would be amazing. Japan's Prime Minister has vowed full efforts to prevent acts of terror in the lead-up to the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. Shinzo Abe was speaking in a lower house committee meeting. Working closely with the international community, we are vigorously strengthening our information gathering and analysis capabilities to detect at an early stage any signs of disturbing trends. We are also tightening border controls and cooperation with relevant agencies to prevent terrorists from entering the country and boosting security at key facilities like airports and public transportation. Abe also spoke about the National Security Council's response to the recent hostage crisis in the Middle East involving two Japanese nationals. The council was set up in 2013 to oversee foreign and security policies. Now, Abe said the NSC discussed the local situation before his departure for the Middle East in January and twice conducted in-depth examinations of the crisis once it began. He said that although the outcome was regrettable, the NSC functioned Japan well. Japan is expecting more international visitors in the run-up to the 2020 Summer Olympics and Paralympics in Tokyo. But many airline pilots in Japan are almost ready to retire. Japan's transportation ministry plans to change mandatory retirement for commercial pilots from 64 years of age to 67. Along with the 2020 Games, the entry of more budget carriers into the airline market is expected to lead to an increase in demand for pilots. Many commercial pilots in Japan are scheduled to retire around the year 2030. The ministry made the decision on Friday to cope with the expected shortage of qualified pilots in the near future. Officials said pilots aged 65 or older will have to undergo stricter health checkups than their younger colleagues. The ministry will limit working hours for older pilots and they will be required to fly with co-pilots under 60 years of age. The new age limit is expected to take effect in April. Workers at a Japanese manufacturing firm have unveiled a product they hope will take off commercially and revitalize a community. They've launched the country's first mass production program for drones, and they're building them in an area people had to evacuate after the Fukushima nuclear accident. Stop with a firm called Kikuchi Seisaksho made the demonstration flight at their factory in Minami Soma City. Their drone can fly up to 30 minutes. It takes off and lands automatically. And it can hover. Company representatives say the cost to build each unit is around $17,000. They hope to cut that in half. A venture firm backed by a university handled the drone's development. Staff there are excited about the benefits the factory offers the surrounding region. We need to create a new industry to accelerate recovery. People working there will revitalize the area. The drone factory is a great first step. 
The manufacturers say they received orders from customers in Japan and the United States. They plan to build 400 drones a year. A Japanese government panel has looked at the possible effects of a major earthquake in Tokyo. It estimates over 20,000 people would be killed and millions more would be stranded amid serious traffic congestion. Authorities have released new guidelines for responding to such a large-scale disaster. After the massive earthquake in 2011, Tokyo came to a standstill. Roads were jammed with people trying to drive back home, blocking ambulances and other rescue vehicles. If a megaquake were to occur directly under the capital, wrecked and abandoned cars would cause even bigger problems. In this scenario, the city of Tokyo and the central government would call on private companies for help to remove wreckage. A new plan puts priority on opening eight different routes between the heart of Tokyo and surrounding areas. Under the plan, officials would check the damage to roads and decide which sections need to be cleared immediately. The plan calls for at least one route with inward and outward lanes to be cleared and opened within 48 hours. The president of a towing service says the government has asked his company to secure roads in the event of a disaster, but he said this is the only thing that's been decided so far. We will need to discuss specific and concrete details. Looking after stranded commuters is another issue. On March 11, 2011, railway stations in Tokyo were packed with people after the earthquake forced trains to stop. I'm at a total loss. I have no choice but to walk. A massive quake in the capital would leave more than 900,000 people with no way to get home. Tokyo Metropolitan officials say only about 20 percent of them would be able to find accommodations. Many private companies are unwilling to open their facilities to stranded commuters. They are worried that they might be held responsible for any accidents or other problems. The new government guidelines make clear that companies providing shelter will not be held responsible for accidents when they are not at fault. The guidelines show that authorities would not pin blame only on private companies but rather work together. Experts say that in order to win the cooperation of the private sector, legal immunity needs to be guaranteed. Government officials are turning to technology to help control disasters caused by earthquakes. They're looking at circuit breakers that automatically shut down in response to movement, reducing the risk of fire. Members of an expert panel have been tasked with evaluating the technology. The breakers automatically stop the flow of electricity when they detect strong tremors. The panel has drawn up testing guidelines to determine if the breakers perform correctly. The devices must shut down when there's a strong jolt, but keep lights on so people can evacuate. Experts have estimated that a strong quake in Tokyo could kill 16,000 people, but officials say the new breakers could cut that figure to 5% of that. <laughs> Quake-sensitive breakers should be introduced as soon as possible to prevent fires in a massive earthquake, especially in areas with a lot of wooden houses. A major earthquake struck Kobe in western Japan 20 years ago. Government officials estimate that more than 60 percent of the fires that broke out after were caused by electrical appliances. People are celebrating Lunar New Year this week, and many of them are spending the holiday right here in Japan. That's been putting retailers in a pretty festive mood. They expect more Chinese shoppers this year due to the weaker yen and easier visa requirements. Businesses have been coming up with goods and services that are aimed at Chinese tourists. HK World's Akiko Okamoto has more in this report. Tourist buses carrying people from China and Taiwan arrive in downtown Tokyo. They're here to shop. <laughs> Japanese retailers see this as a good chance to boost sales. <laughs> Chinese shoppers flock to this major electronics retailer. It operates duty-free stores nationwide. Made in Japan rice cookers are a hot item. There's so much stuff to buy in Tokyo, and they're trendy. The store is offering 20,000 lucky bags just for the tourists. Whoever buys this one will find two luxury handbags inside or two high-end watches. 
They cost 8.8 .8 million yen, or $75,000. Store managers chose that price because eight is a lucky number in China. Japanese retailers don't usually reveal what the bags contain, but they're not common in China. Managers decided to tell shoppers what they might find inside. My budget is about $3,000 to $5,000. I bought rice cookers, thermoses, and electric toothbrushes. 80% of our customers are Chinese. They are very important to us. We are trying to provide the best service for them. Managers at this department store are also trying to boost sales. This department store wants to satisfy their customers by putting employees who speak Chinese at the duty-free counter. Managers say sales of duty-free products have already tripled compared to the same period last year. Uh, I spent about $1,700. The falling yen is making everything very cheap. We're hoping Chinese customers spend a lot during the holiday. Chinese tourists are doing more than shopping. Some are visiting Kagawa Prefecture to make udon noodles. They're a local specialty. The number of people from China and Taiwan visiting Kagawa has risen since the start of regular flights from Shanghai and Taipei. About 100 people are learning to make noodles. It's fun to learn something new during the New Year holiday. I'd like to visit more parts of the country to experience local Japanese lifestyles. Personal spending is still sluggish in Japan. Japanese retailers have high hopes that the Chinese customers will pick up the slack.